respected and honourable brothers and elders. As our deen is a very complete way of life, alhamdulillah, we have certain things within our Islamic tradition that can help us in every field of life. Islam is not just a religion to pray or, or, or just to fast or give charity, but these are the five pillars of Islam, but we have a much deeper tradition even beyond the five pillars. The general misconception amongst a lot of the masses is if I pray and I do fast and I call myself a Muslim and if I have enough money do give zakat and perhaps go hajj, then that is the be all and end all. This literally refers to as the bunyad of Islam and the basis of Islam. And beyond this is a whole practical way of life. In Islam, one of the things which we have to try and achieve or we'll learn about within this humble worldly life is what Allah expects and wants from us. What does he tell us to abstain from? What are those things which are liked in Islam? What are those things which are disliked in Islam? Or in simple English, as some ulama have pointed out, to know what are the do's of Islam and to understand what are the don'ts of Islam. We as Muslims need to acquaint ourselves with these particular things. It's kind of sad because we've drifted away from that legacy of knowledge. When we're informed of something that may be halal or haram, we raise skepticism because we've not heard it before. And someone says, oh, I haven't heard this before. And this is the first time I'm hearing this. Okay, just because we have not heard it before, does that mean that thing is non-existent? Perhaps if we have not come across something before, does that mean that uh, it is something which I've just conjured up or just made out of thin air? Of course not. This is the um, thing we have to try to understand, that we have to connect ourselves to our deen, because our deen has a very, very massive tradition. And Islam is not just within the four corners of a building, or four corners of a masjid, or in a madrasa. It's a practical way of life. So from the time we open up our eyes, to the time we close our eyes, from the time we raise, raise our bed, and the time we get to bed, every interim stage, from the time we come into this world, to the time we leave this world, every stage there is something in our deen that teaches us and, uh, and, and educates us. <clears throat> going forward inshallah because I'm going to be coming here for a few weeks if you man can handle the English lingo inshallah we're here anyway what's going to happen is is uh, instead of just having as an ad hoc Jumma Bayan and I'd rather have a focus you get me work on something so the brothers can educate themselves and I thought to myself you know one of the things which is often neglected in our communities and it's something which is massively in dire need is spirituality and to understand that Islam is practical. Islam is a practical way of life. Islam is not just some, you know, some airy fairy Alice in Wonderland deen. Islam is a very practical way of living. Alhamdulillah, Islam has the solution for everything until the day of Qiyamah. If we think there's something deficient, it's because it's our understanding. It's nothing to do with the deen, it's our shortcoming, our shortfall that we haven't understood Islam. To, to connect to our deen, the legacy of spirituality, the legacy of ta'alluq and connection with Allah. I thought it would be interesting, important, pertinent to touch on these subjects, inshallah. Things which are in relation to the heart, or you can call them isla of the nafs, rectification of the soul. What do I mean by that? We have qualities within us, and we also have negative traits. We have what is referred to as akhlaq. And we have our, 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 our character, but we, we have khasail and we have radail. Now these are Arabic terms. What does that simply mean? We have things that are good inside us, but we also have things that are negative. For example, some of us may have anger. Not, so let me say that again. Not some of us, all of us have anger. If you don't have anger in you, if you saw someone breaking the commands of Allah, you wouldn't feel anything in your heart because there's no anger there. If you got told, by the way, your daughter ran away with some boy, then you wouldn't feel no anger because there's no anger in there. So th we have anger. But it's got to be used in the right way. Wrong anger will get vented in a way Allah dislikes, but to vent it in the correct way, Allah likes. So there's a boundary with everything in deen. Everyone sitting here came as a product of a husband and wife union. Sexual relations is something we as human beings need, desire and crave, and more so in the summertime. Now, is it taboo? Oh, Molbi sab? Kya, ab kya kya rahe? Arre, kya kya rahe ho? Bhai, this is reality. 
Because we've shied away from these things and the Sahaba would ask these questions, we look at them as taboo subjects. They're not taboo. What's taboo in deen? There's no taboo in deen, man. We're educating ourselves. But I'm just giving you an example that there's no shyness in our religion. It's practical. It's a practical way of life. So I said, we have an attraction to a woman, naturally. But then there's a halal way and there's a haram way. You're allowed to have a wife, but you're not allowed to have a girlfriend. You're allowed to have a spouse, a woman, a married woman you marry to have your nikah. But you can't have some bit on the side. So Islam isn't about restricting desires. It's about showing you those right desires, showing you the right way how to use those desires. And that is why I thought it's important that we touch on certain subjects related to the heart. For example, pride, jealousy, hatred, anger, envy, all these things which it seems so blasé, but yet, wallah, we don't understand the harms they can have on our spirituality. I'll give you an example. We were talking a couple of days ago, I was talking to a couple of family members, youngsters, teenagers, and I mentioned about jealousy. And I said, being jealous of someone else's spiritual, financial, anything, any development is not permissible in Islam. And they said, but why, how, how, that doesn't make sense. Like, how can you stop yourself from being jealous? And I was like, this is the problem. It's a condition of the heart and you can train it. You can, wait, you can work on it. So you don't use that jealousy in a wrong way or you're not using those qualities in a negative way. Rather, you understand where that is coming from and you stop the problem becoming something big. Now, again, this is another topic. I'm not going to digress. But I'm just touching upon what is going to come in the future and understand that spirituality, connecting to the deen, is something of utmost importance. We're not going to get 100% agreement on certain things. Some people, for example, might tie their hands here. Some people might tie their hands here. Some may say, Amin loudly. Some may say, Amin quietly. You're never going to get 100% everyone agreeing. And I'm not going to try and make sure, I'm not going to try and make out that that's possible. It's not, I don't think it's going to be possible. But what can be achieved is we all agree on certain subjects like spirituality, like pleasing Allah, like, for example, these things, inshallah, which I'm going to focus on. And that, inshallah, will be our focus. In essence, in essence, what does Islam entail? Whether you call it the sawwaf, whether you call it suluk, whether you call it ihsan, whether you call it spirituality, the maqsad and the object is one. How do I bring all the do's in my life that Allah says and how do I abstain from all the don'ts? These things are fard upon us in addition to our five pillars which we normally equate Islam with. So when you think of Islam, brother, you say Islam is praying five times a day, fasting, zakat, khalas. No, no, it's a very, very wider application than that. That's just a starting point. It goes much beyond this. And that's what we're going to talk about, inshallah. These do's and don'ts in a practical way. And you'll understand that Islam is coming from a very practical way, inshallah. And now, just to give a simple understanding, like, uh, just, uh, just to give a brief illustration of what I'm talking about. You've got two types of things. One is what is referred to as, one is referred to as humility, tawadur. Humble. Allah likes humbleness. Allah loves humbleness. But it mentions in the hadith, مَنْ تَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Whoever's humble for Allah's sake, Allah will elevate him. But now there's a fine line between being humble and disgracing yourself. It may seem like the person, that that's the same thing. That one side it seems humble, but one side, where do you draw the line between the two? So if someone, for example, is, you know, you have some people that abase themselves, you know, I don't know and degrade themselves. Well, we don't know whether they're doing that out of humility or whether it's zillatul nafs. There's a fine line between the two. And it's only for a person who, who understands these things to be able to differentiate and say, no, hold on a second. Now, this is getting beyond the stage of what is required in the deen. Now you're going to a stage of impermissibility. I don't know if that makes sense. Let me give you another example. Izzatul nafs is something. Or... Let's use another one. Pride. Pride and tahdith bin ni'mah. Pride is when you think you're better than other people or you're boasting about your achievements. Ta'alli. You're boasting about your achievements. Do you know, mashallah, bro, do you know how many businesses I've got yet? Do you know how many shops I've got? Man's chucking out thousand pound a week in his business, fam. Trust me. You're playing catch up. My takeaway is better than yours. See my car, see my houses. That's pride. That's the gabr. But on the other side is this. Alhamdulillah. All which you see, Allah gave me, alhamdulillah. Tahdith bin ni'mah. They're both saying the same thing, but can you see the motive is different? Now to a person who looks there, they'll say, I see my man, see how proud he is. 
see how he thinks he's better than other people. But no, perhaps he's saying it. Tahdith bin Ni'ma, ki Allah ka shukur, look what Allah has given me. So there's a fine line between a lot of the things are permissible and impermissible, and that is why not every single thing. So for example, having pride is a bad thing. Now, if I, if I bust this watch, I'm wearing this watch, and it's a couple of hundred quid, I don't feel nothing obvious, nothing. It's just a little piece of metal on my arm. But then someone, it may give them takabur and deliberately roll up their sleeve so man can see his watch. Oh, oh, why are you doing that for? What's the motive? Why is it you need to show yourself in that manner? Is there pride there? Because if it is, then for you, you that is not permissible for you to wear that watch. I can come in here wearing those, those trainers I got. They could be from Tesco, 15 quid, or they could be from Knightsbridge, Selfridge, it's 150 quid. And I feel proud now because I'm wearing it. Two people are wearing the same thing. But for one, he just looks at it as a pair of trainers. And one is looking at it with pride. The one who's wearing it with pride, for him it's not permissible. For the other guy it is. And that is why mashaykh, ulama, people of knowledge, they've studied this stuff. And they normally say, and that's why people come and they say, I spoke to one Molana, he told me this masala, he told you the same thing but different. But these ulama, they just don't agree. No, no. Because masala can be different based on the person at that time. That's what you study in Islam. That's what you study in the madrasa. It's not just so great, straightforward. And I'll mention, I'll finish off on this one hadith. I've got one minute left. One youngster, two people came to the Prophet in Ramadan. An elderly gentleman, elderly sahabi, and a young sahabi. And the old sahabi, he said, am I allowed to kiss my wife in Ramadan? Now we're not talking about, we're talking of a general dry kiss here. So no Frenching going on. This is simple, straightforward kiss. No exchange of saliva. He said, he gave him a jazza, for you it's okay. A youngster came and said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, can I kiss my wife? He said, no, no, for you it's not allowed. So then the Sahaba naturally asked the question, okay, what's the, why the difference? You gave him yes, but him a no. He said, look, he's an old man. He's been married for many years. Many summers and winters have passed with that lady. He can control himself. But this youngster, you give him an inch and he'll take a yard. He'll... Start from a kiss and the next will be, mashallah, all out. And it's Ramadan. And if you do that in Ramadan, you have to pay a kafara for doing that. If you have sexual intercourse in Ramadan deliberately while fasting, you have to fast for 60 days consecutively as a penalty. Kafara. So I said no to him, but I gave him ijazah. You see, now ulama will understand this, but the general masses won't. So this is why, inshallah, we will talk about this. And it's not just so great, and that's where, where you have any further questions, then I'm here, inshallah, to help. We'll finish off on this. I think I've gone just over one minute. May Allah give us tawfiq to understand, practice, implement, and bring within our lives, inshallah. Wa akhirat da'wan, and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.